Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover and thank you for joining me here in TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we're playing as England at the very start of the campaign. Now, if you'd like to read about England and how we got here, please go right ahead, but um, I've already played technically England twice. I played the Thatcher route, I've played the Macmillan route, and actually, if you'd like to check out those, those two campaigns, uh, they'll be the first and second links in the description below, but I figured, you know what, I've not yet played as Himmler, or the HMMLR, was that? His Majesty or Her Majesty's Most Loyal Resistance. So we're going to begin with TikTok, TikTok. Um, actually, I've already read this one once. So if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. My goal for this opening like video here for this campaign really is for us to uh, just make you know get to the Civil War as fast as possible. Also, right now uh, we need this PP for later on, but I don't care. We're spending it for this stuff here. Actually, can we spend any more? Hold on, let's not do that one first then. I get twenty-six. Because I... Nope. Okay, we're good. Just because I want to make sure that we're spending, spending, spending. Building, building, building. Because I like Northern England. Don't ask me anything about it because I know nothing about it. Except that there's a lot of people in England. Probably. But because of this, we're going to go a state beneath the feet. Her, most ma Her Majesty's most loyal resistance. A catch-all term for a problem that has eluded solutions for nigh on 20 years. The current organization is probably better described as a combination of three. David Sterling's commandos are the largest rogue military unit in England, which don't didn't surrender following the war, and the only ones still active in England proper. Bill Alexander and the left resistance are an amalgamation of assorted leftist partisans and labor supporters, though they might not be as influential as a CPGB that perished at the third Cable Street. Infuriatingly, however, the original Himmler's group is unknown, or leader's group is unknown. Some spy master in the shadows, no doubt if he ever still lives, but he somehow managed to get almost every major partisan organization in England to answer to him despite ideological differences. This organization is a thorn in our side, and must, we must access it. Enable the gameplay from this perspective of Himmler. Great. And sabotaging Edward's speech. Great. Copper and the rebel. Timothy O'Flaherty considered himself about as normal as one could be under the circumstances. He left school once he could read and write, followed his dad into a bobby once he met the age requirements, got to the rank of inspector, and even found a nice lass to settle down with. But the rest of the world? Tim happened to think the rest of the world wasn't so normal at all. The police hadn't changed much since the Germans invaded. He never got the chance to fight London. Fight. London surrendered before the Germans reached his unit's position, but he knew more than a few good men who didn't live to see the war's end. In his eyes, it was what had come after that had been worse. The London uprising, not to mention the constant terrorism, not by the Fenians, but by the Englishmen against the German tyrants, and Tim had to stop them. But whatever he thought of the government, they had a point. The rebels winning might as well end in the Germans coming back. And for his wife and daughter's sake, he'd do anything to prevent that. Passing Inspector O'Flaherty was Griselda Robbins, a young woman whom the police would probably put a great amount of effort fighting if they knew who she was. Griselda had grown up under the boo. She watched a German killer friend in the London Uprising and watched her brother beg on the streets because he couldn't even earn a living with his leg blown off. No matter what the government promised, the Germans hadn't left, which is why she joined Himmler. It hadn't been easy. Griselda had followed rumors for months before they had noticed her, and after she passed the test of loyalty, she ended up joining the local cell. London might be the home for traitors, after all, but they were an arrogant bunch who couldn't even notice those moving beneath their feet. The die is cast, and the gears begin to move. The funny thing about any moving machine is that it keeps moving, even when the operator is no longer there to guide it. Everyone can agree that the statement applies to Himmler, but with different definitions. The collaborationist government thinks that the organization is like a speeding car, with no driver, going aimlessly until it runs out of fuel or veers off the road and comes to a halt. They see the rebellion as a shadow of its former self, huddled in the hills and cowering in the sewers, and a victory for law and order against the forces of anarchy is a matter of when of, instead of if. Many women of Himmler, however, prefer a different anarchy, or an analogy. They see themselves as a different machine, one that does not need an operator once activated, one that can be safely left alone until the moment to fulfill its duty at its hand. They are a ticking time bomb, and they are counting down to the beginning of His Majesty's speech. Also, I've already played this off-screen before. Like, we have to deal with the state, the state of the nation, increase support all over the place, which is fine. And we have guns. So this is why we need a political power, but I'm more interested in doing the speech. Do so we need guns right now? The best thing to do is send in agents, periodic change of the safety of the future speech, anti-government propaganda, and then infiltrate the palace. Oh, if we just keep doing this one, we'll be fine. So, um, we're going to need a lot more guns. Actually, like I said, I already played this once off screen, so, like, this is really easy to do. So, also, just as a PSA, if you, have you ever played, if you tried England yourself and you're wondering why I'm not making factories, because we have nothing here, it's, it's, the devs intended for this to happen, which actually makes a lot of sense because of basically the Civil War that would come. So, we have these icons, but it doesn't really matter until the Civil War is basically begun, but hidden beneath their feet. Grisotto was only part of Himmler, it was only part of of one of the only Himmler cells inside the city of London proper, and probably the only one which wasn't outright underground at first. She'd been just a regular member, but with some those above her being continually killed or driven out by the collabs, she soon found herself the leader of the cell. 
Most of the day has consisted of working as a barmaid in a pub sympathetic to the cause, listening on in on conversations and keeping an eye out for new recruits. Every now and then, though, we're still get some real work, smuggling out firearms, explosives, or even important people to sell in other parts of the country. Of course, sometimes the higher-ups wanted her to do the same thing. As far as Griselda knew, she answered to whom I coordinated London proper, but she never saw them and only got marching orders through a dead drop or a coded letter. If she were to be honest with herself, Griselda wasn't that fuss on the return of the Queen. Or whatever the official line was, Griselda wanted her revenge against those who betrayed England. And if Himmler were the ones offering, or, uh, who was she to turn them down? She was part of the fight for freedom, and she would die for it if need be. The motivations of a person can be as simple as a knife or complex as a maze. So right now we want to make sure the change get down as far down <clears throat> to blue as possible. <clears throat> King Edward's not going to be able to give a speech here. Mm -mm. And actually we're losing political power too, by the way, so... Um, let's go ahead and do the big, big, big love. If you know me, I love big love, but most of him are moderates by any sense of the word. Men and women who want freedom, more than anything more specific. But David Sterling and Bill Alexander have other goals. Sterling wants revenge. He's about the only surviving man still in the country who never surrendered, and he's lost a lot of friends for that. <clears throat> Mr. Alexander wants his revolution, though he's willing to forego that to get the Germans out of Britain for good. He lost a lot of good friends on the 3rd Cable Street during the first uprising, but he survived, and he'll have to have his turn to do the killing. Achimlech, however, uh, he wants the Traitor King's speech to be a proper show, complete with the Himmler as the entertainment. Sterling and Alexander might hate each other's guts, but they're more experienced in guerrilla warfare than the rest of Himmler combined. Time for them to use it. Safety of the speech goes down by 10%. Nice. PR exchange and speech goes down by 2.5. Nice, nice, nice. Hmm. There ain't going to be any safety down there. And everything else up top doesn't mean anything. Training is fine. Um, you know what? How about we lose our, all our fuel? Train. Sorry, I forgot to set this up off screen. Um, I usually set everything up off screen, just be but because of the way things are going to run here, just it doesn't even matter really. No more safety. Well, actually, technically, period like change. It's only going down by ten percent. So, do we need to do anything here? Stirrings of a plan. Yeah. We'll do it anyways, because we can, why not? Because <laughs> we can. We, we'll have more than enough guns for the future anyway, so. The stirrings of a plan. No one quite knew who the boss was actually was. Oh, to be sure, everyone knew of Mad David Sterling and the Red General Alexander. Of course, one had refused to surrender with the rest of the army and had fought on since the end of the war. And the other was the most notorious communist to have escaped Cable Street. Some thought those were the two were the leader, the two were the leaders of Himmler, and the boss was a smokescreen of fiction to keep the traitors' attention elsewhere. Griselda personally thought that unlikely as she took a look at the two. In spite of the collegiality and pointing out key locations on the map of London, all she could do was think about that, that, that was that they obviously didn't like each other very much. It was a small thing, the way Sterling grimaced when Alexander rebuked his idea of placing dynamite on the bridge on account of the casualties, or how Alexander frowned upon when Sterling suggested his men would be better suited to open attempt on the king. Griselda was at the meeting because she was the highest ranking cell leader in London, not forced underground, a sobering thought, considering that she wasn't even in her 30s. There'd be plenty who came before, and plenty to come after, it seemed, and... That was when an idea formed in her mind. What if I do it? She interrupted in a small voice. The two Himmler leaders looked up at her in surprise. Bill Alexander gestured for her to continue whilst Sterling looked her over with a fresh eye, as if searching for something he'd missed before. I mean, I walk through that square each day for work. The Bobbies know me well enough that they won't think twice about why I'm going so close to the cordon. Griselda stopped and waited for the two's response. In the end, it was Sterling who answered. How familiar are you with the grenade throwing? Himmler is all sorts, including the brave ones. Well, we're moderate. Um, I actually want to save my PP, but you know, let's grab some medium guns first. Um, uh, result in a large oh, and boost. We're gonna have enough guns for a while. I don't know, we'll be okay. It's still gonna go down, so we don't even need to do anything else here. Right? So ten percent, thirty percent. Four hundred weapons available. There you go. It just goes down, so we already maxed it out. There's no point to do any of that then. Plan in motion. He had no doubt that, right, as he was standing over the map of London, the reactionaries would be sending a dozen raids after him in England's north. Such a shame they didn't realize he was in a basement not a kilometer away from Buckingham Palace itself. Bill Alexander chuckled at the thought, gaining the attention of the man next to him. Sometimes Bill regretted signing the left resistance up with Himmler, and any time he had to work personally with David Sterling only made him feel the surface. Oh, that feeling resurface. The man was effective, to be sure. Sterling had kept his commanders alive by sheer unrelenting determination for nearly 20 years. But he was also ruthless and unconcerned with civilian casualties, which made Bill think he was quite possibly very mad. Bill had his men smuggle in the grenades in the days before his arrival, and Philby had sent word that the reactionaries still thought Bill was in Manchester. 
Sterling in turn had escorted Bale down to the Trader Central as the XSAS referred to London. The king wouldn't like the welcome they had prepared for him. Sterling was glancing at him to see if the chuckle had, had any meaning at all, but Bill just waved him off. The evacuation point is a boat in the Thames, which you, you will take up your north, you understand? Finish any unfinished business you have here, because you won't be coming back anytime soon. Trigritta, Grisilda, the local Himmler soul leader, just nodded, committed the plan of memory. Against his expectations, Bill was starting to have a good feeling about this whole exercise. He yeah, hoped Claude was handling things in his absence. Let's get this party started. Now, if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. I've already read this before, so... Almost there. Ah, well, for the big screen. Big screen? Big time. Yeah, I want to get large gunship, I'll be honest. And I do want to do this one, too. I like the multiple moderate open relationship boosts. Mmm... Guns. Reach out to USA politicians. I don't like this. This one. I don't like this one. A result in multiple small open relationship boosts. That's okay, in my opinion. Small is not really worth it because you're going to miss it. But writing on the wall. Well, you only need to look at the streets of London to see how right the city is for revolution. It's like a bale of hay only in the need of a spark to set the entire house afire. The police are no problem. Those who are on our side will be dealt with by the ones who are. If they can't be bribed into staying back, of course. The crowds, that was something Bill's lads saw. Turns out when you know half the unions in the country, you can get a few of them to turn out and act as a disruptive influence for a public event. Like this speech. With Sterling's lot acting like as civvies to lead them, we ought to give the king a right surprise when he turns out for tea and biscuits. Something this entire country will remember forever. Ability to decrease the safety of the speech will end. Alright, the king and the pauper. Um... I think I've already read this before, but let's do this. Edward VIII, listed as the chief of the city of London police, outlined his plans for security, which something approaching a dull interest. The king of England didn't really know why the man insisted upon having so many rotations of guards about location of the speech, but given recent events, Edward was inclined to listen. Whispers had reached Edward that Himmler intended to kill him at the speech, something that he initially refused to believe. Surely, no group loyal to his niece, to his niece, would kill the reigning monarch. At the same time, a voice in his head had asked, what if they were right? Edward hadn't gotten any sleep for days. Wallace had noticed and started fretting, only making the whole affair worse. Yeah, checking with American, is, is that true? Edward had solved to not have her present at the speech. That way, even if something did go wrong, she would not be in the line of fire. As for himself, well, as his brother's always been so fond of saying, he had a duty to attend to. Griselda had memorized every guard rotation. Sterling had insisted upon it. Alexander had gone over the evacuation route with her and gotten her to warn her brother and mother ahead of time, once he had gotten assurances that they weren't likely to turn traitor. The main thing that Griselda had worked on was her throwing skills, where when she had might have had all the skill at some tosh fresh out of a bar, she now had at least a basic grasp of distance and the time he needed before she ran. She was ready, and Griselda dearly hoped that that would be enough. The die is cast, and we're things about to get very explosive here. A promising report is very nice. If you are anybody with a keen speech, please go right ahead. Uh, a promising report. Ca Claude Auchinleck sat reading the report delivered to him by his spies. It would be unprofessional to laugh, he thought, taking a sip of tea to mask the amusement he felt. It was kind of a pain pained hilarity. Based on the report he was reading, the once great army of England had been reduced to a bunch of gibbering idiots who didn't know how to do much other than line up information. Even that, according to the report in front of him, was done with some difficulty. You're so sure these reports are accurate, he asked the spy who had delivered them. Yes, I was able to see the war games as they occurred, the spy replied. It was quite the showing. Poor sods could barely march in formation. Auchinleck hummed as he sifted through the papers, taking yet another sip of tea. By all accounts, it seemed the war games had been disastrous. It was a stunning display of English incompetence. The way things are now, he mused, the English army wouldn't be able to put down a serious uprising. From what I saw, the spot chuckled. They could barely put down a crowd of hooligans, let alone an army insurrection. Auchinleck frowned. The problem, as always, seems to be the Germans. They all actually know what they're doing. There are only so many of them. The Cornish garrison doesn't have enough manpower to put us down by itself, the spy argued. Even if they're better trained, we can simply overwhelm them with sheer numbers. <clears throat> That's not the point, uh, stressed Auchinleck. The Germans saw the exact same thing that we did and likely came to the exact same conclusions. If you think that the Germans are going to sit around and let the English army languish when they know that we're about to hear, we're out here, you're a fool. We need to be prepared, or prepared to face the consequences. Or both, really. We are ready to go, my friends. Let's just the shindig on the road. Actually, I'm really just waiting to get this one, so it's fine. We'll have more than enough time to make sure that we are good and ready, my friends. And we're led by Alec Douglas home. Oh, we have the House of Commons. Oh, a convenient illness. As Timothy or Flaherty sat on the couch with the telly turned on to some children's show you're reflected, that maybe you should take a day off of work more often. Not every month, not every, even every six years, but maybe a year wouldn't do any harm. His daughter seemed ignorant of the fact that he was watching them instead of their mother and had busied themselves assembling the dollhouse he'd bought them with what he was telling Martha was a special bonus. And truth be told, it was a special bonus. It wasn't every day a man showed up at your door and offered you 500 quid to stay at home on a specific day. Oh, yes. Tim wouldn't have acted on it except for the fact that he caught several of the younger constables chatting among themselves on the subject. And upon some discreet inquiries, had even discovered his boss, the chief inspector, was taking the sp king's speech off. If everyone was doing it, why not him? 
It could think of a lot of things he'd rather do than stand about in a line all day and watch a crowd riot. Something that was reinforced as his wife brought the tea tray out and sat on the table. Oh yes, no need to go into work today. Family can be its own reward, my friends. It... Oh, very good. Non-existent... That's fine. I want the multiple boosts. And we'll have options to do a whole lot of stuff. So here, but quote! The grenade toss has been almost perfect, landing amongst the people behind the king rather than at the traitor's feet. But the results have been impressive nonetheless. The king had been hustled off unharmed, but this cronies hadn't been so lucky. Griselda had left London with the help from Sterling's men and Alexander's smugglers, and been taken north, deep into the north too. Past Yorkshire, at least, if she was to be any judge. It wasn't until Griselda entered the small house in the middle of nowhere, though, that she realized what her actions had truly meant. The men with her had talked about taking her to see the boss, and of the five people in the room, it was obvious who it was. <coughs> It wasn't Big Bill Alexander standing aside with a beer in hand and chatting with a thin gentleman in a suit. It wasn't Sterling catching the first bit of sleep he'd seen in days. It was a figure almost every English citizen knew. Member of Parliament Claude Auchinleck, a former general who had been the last British officer holding his position at the time of the surrender to Germany. A living legend in almost every sense of the word and evidently the leader of Her, most, of her Majesty's most loyal resistance. Griselda gave a salute as she entered, but he waved it off and invited her to sip. They talked for some time about how the sacrifice of her civilian life was appreciated, how her family had been evacuated along with the rest of herself, and about her future career prospects. Similar had need of operatives of ferry communication between the cells that couldn't be trusted to regular couriers, and according to Auchinleck, she fit the bill perfectly. Death to traitors, my friends. Apparently God was fond of the king this day. Unfortunate, but today's a resistance. Now this is exactly why I want to show you everything here, because I've done the government route. Now with Himmler's assistance, I've not read through any of these, so in the future, whenever I play this route again, I'm probably, probably, not guaranteed, but probably going to just start off after the Civil War, but there's a resistance. Alkenluck, Alexander, and Sterling. The first is a name not known by too many, aside from as a curiosity being the last general standing when the call to surrender was sounded. The second is probably the best known by the general public, one of the few rebels who escaped Cable Street, and a constant reminder of those darker times. Sterling is only known by those who hunt him, those who still live. Today, they represent Himmler, an organization dedicated to as many causes as its members have political leanings, but undeniably united in the desire for free England. Free England. One free of tyranny, one free of traitors, and free of uh, those despicable Saxons. The partnership is one of convenience, but all involved intend to see it out until the end, until the collaborationists are defeated or they've died trying. Give more political power, because right now we are losing 0.16, which is garbage, but now we must do the fun thing of doing this until the Mr. Adolf Hitler dies. So, we're going to do expand cells in every single place just because by the end of this, actually, when I tried this off screen by myself, I made almost every single tile here blue. So, this is the way to do it. And this is why we need a lot of guns. And I should have got more guns, but we'll get more guns later on. It's fine. I'm really not too worried about it. We'll turn London gray. And just double check, because this is early on. Uh, we hit every single one of them, hopefully. Bing, bong, boom. Yes, we have. Very nice. It happens every first of the month you get to do it again, so. We're non-existent. Maybe we should have got more guns with the right. Whatever. Multiple small groups. Eh. Small open boost. Large. I kind of don't mind that one, actually. I like the large boost, actually, so. Uh, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna wait to do it with someone else, so. Bill's connections? Yes, please. The revolution is not yet dead. Not so while Bill Alexander lives. He survived the war, Cable Street, in Russia, and there's no way in the heck the fascists can succeed with their masters and Germania failed. He built the left resistance from the ground up, and now the revolution begins again. Our connections to the exile communities exceed that, even that of Himmler's proper. And with most of the dock workers' unions on our side, smuggling in supplies, weapons, and even people is no problem at all. When Himmler needs explosives, they come to us. When they need a message sent, they ask us to do the sending. And whilst that bunch of monarchists might be reactionary, they're still in agreement with us on the main point. England will be free or dead by the time we're done. The men of the resistance, Alkenluck looked at the table and saw a motley crowd of men, all of them holding beliefs and ideologies that would make otherwise them utterly incompatible with one another. But they were also the men who would fight and die together to see the Nazis removed from England. They were Cloud's own Himmler forces, men who joined up with him from inside the collaborationist government. They sat in the reformist wing of the royal party, but they secretly pledged their lives for when the time came to establish new free England under Her Majesty Elizabeth II. Their two most influential members, Enoch Powell and George Jellico, joined him today. There also was allies in the SAS. David Sterling never stopped fighting the Hun, and no intent on doing so as long as he still drew breath. It gathered a powerful and skilled force strong enough to go toe to toe with any unit of the Wehrmacht or the collaborationist army. Its forces had an extreme hatred for anything collaborationist, and they wished to drive them out with even more than Claude did. He was accompanied by Arthur Harris, who was organizing what he ominously called a little present for Jerry. And finally, the Law for Resistance. Born out of the ashes of Cable Street, this new organization was the co coalition of surviving communists, labor members, and other hard leftists under the leadership of Bell Alexander. Despite being a staunch communist, Bell brought in the more moderate Harold Wilson to solidify a standing with the Social Democrats. He was even willing to collaborate with Himmler, somehow stomaching working alongside the rabidly anti-communist Sterling. 
Cloud looked at each of these faces one last time before he began to speak. The bombing attempt on Edward had failed, but a far larger blast, bigger blast for the Cloud Raiders was in store. Here's our next move. And there's really no point to do anything here yet. We just need to get more guns, but... It's alright, and after that, uh, we'll get more guns here anyway, so Flood of Volunteers. Uh, actually, since we have no manpower, I do want to do this one next. Sterling's methods. Most of Hemba doesn't want to get involved in the shady stuff. Can't blame him as it's all horrible work. Bombs and traitor cars, men with guns waiting in a portion of buggers' rooms at nights, makes the GM feel a bit dishonorable. Still, really, they sold us out to the Germans, so it's not as if they didn't earn it. The Reds do the same if we're honest, but they've had to learn it. Cable Street killed all their best, and even the bloody dread general can't make new soldiers from thin air like he can everything else. Sterling taught us the fight was dirty from the start, give no quarter and receive none. Fight till you're dead, and then some more. What makes d killing a dozen at dinner any less honorable than a thousand on a battlefield? Day in the life of Yorkshire or Yorkshire MP. Sorry, I'm too much of an American to really know all my pronunciations. <clears throat> What a day in the life of me. Oh, chuff. Is this going to be on the telly? Right. Well, I suppose you don't want me to want what I eat for me breakfast, do you? Marmite on the toast if you if you do need that. Anyway, it works all right. Decent pain. Not too difficult. See, when I was getting trained in that, they always said the MPs work straightforward. You just got to keep your eye out, keep your voice steady when you're speaking, and know where to gri grip a drunken saw when you're dragging them back to barracks. Could do with shorter hours, though. Don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining. My brother's here, too, but assigned to one of the rougher districts. That dog lost his pinky to a rebel, even. I, got, I still got all mine. The interviewee spent several moments wriggling his pinky to our reporters before being prompted to continue. Yes, sorry, you lost. You lot probably wanted to get right to the why of it, huh? Uh, why I joined the MPs? Why I stand with the government? It's really because of Mary. That's my wife, bless her. See, when the crowds invaded us the first time, my dad was a soldier. Mom, pregnant with my sibling that never got to be, ended up getting a bayonet to the belly during all the reprisals. I hate the Germans as much as any lad in Himmler, but we aren't going to win another war with them. I'm not going to put my Mary at risk, rebels be darned. I'm not looking for a wife kebab, no thank you. So when I see all my old friends and colleagues spit on me as I walk down the street, I can ignore them. Mary's worth it. Scrolled under the heading, A Day in the Life with a Yorkshire MP Policeman, and bright red pens with the words, Rejected. Find some coherent for the day in the live TV campaign, else we'll end up just having the propaganda ministry make something up. But what does he eat for lunch and dinner? Doesn't matter, we're going to expand the cells everywhere. More cells, more cells. What do we have in our bodies? That's right, we got a lot of cells. Alright, very good, very good. And I'm going to hit the brown parts left, last. Alright, alright. Cool. Cool double check because I want to make sure we got enough things here so after that next focus we're gonna get some more uh, political power and do more stuff here so oh actually we're gonna get more political power anyways from this that's actually really nice that'd be good great 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 and we have no fuel too but that's okay and so yeah terror bombing sign us up all right so now I want to do um you know what I'm gonna do this one first screw it, I'm gonna do that one first and then we'll do that one and then we'll do some more stuff here so we got three days left I might just grab a medium gun shipment first, actually, because we're going to need a few more guns first. It's low. Wow, that sucks. That's actually low. Medium boost goes low. Good to know. If I screw this up, it's fine. I'll, I'll make sure we'll, we'll do okay here. But after this one, who dares wins? Uh, yeah, let's do this one. A couple of tongues. Care the sips sink ships? That was what the government told us before they turned out to be traitors anyway. Still, that particular negative wisdom applies even more now than ever. Half the reason Reds failed at Cable Street is that the comms lacked sophistication. Compromised months before the showdown, the traitors were waiting with the guns at the ready when the revolution began. Certainly isn't the nicest of boss, but he knows what's what. You just don't catch the spies and throw them into the sea anymore. You've got to find out what they told the traitors first. If they don't want to talk, well, you might as we might not be as elegant or means, but we do know how to make a lovely example. A bomb barbaric embrace. Matilda knew it was wrong to the point. Every day there was another article about another man arrested for inhuman acts like kissing his best mate in the showers, which happened a lot in the Brighton. She couldn't see anything inhuman about it, but her parents constantly complained about the homophiles in her, at the dinner table. It had been two months since she and Olivia began snogging behind the box sheds. Not before, talking of course. Talking about how they'd always run away together, escape to America. Live in a big city far away from this town where everyone lived great lives. That was no place for them in England. The bell rang, jolting her from warm hazel orbs and soft pink lips. As everyone walked out of the door in unison, Matilda trailed behind her. She waited by the wall for the other students to leave. The close was clear. Matilda snuck around to the other secret meeting spot where she caught a subtle sobbing. Olivia was sitting against the wall in almost fetal position, her legs face nestled in her le legs. Olivia, Matilda, whispered, or 
Olivia sniffed, I'm scared. Matilda kneeled down and put her love into an embrace. Why is that? She asked gently. At least she hoped it. She asked gently. <laughs> My dad, she went, he went on and on about the homophiles. Um, Olivia sniffed again, rubbing tears from her uh, bloodshot hazel eyes. I'm scared we won't be able to stay together. I'm so scared. Matilda had never seen Olivia like this, so utterly small and scared. She was the only thing keeping her stable in her miserable and dull life. She just, just, I love you, Olivia, and it'll always be with you. I love you, too. Why do we have a picture of someone? Is he filming this? That's very weird to have, but whatever. SAS terror bombing, sign us up. Actually, 10 days, 10 days, we'll get, hmm, 17. That's not enough for the, all that plea PB I want. Uh, that's the case, we'll get a small one first. That's fine. We'll see what happens. It's only 10 political power. SAS terror bombing, on a crisp and quiet morning, MP uh, Howard Trauber put a key in his car ignition to get to work in the House of the Lords. Not a second later, he was engulfed in a horrific fireball as a brave London officer descended on the quiet suburb of Bex Bexley. The re remnants of the attack painted a vile picture. Four people were killed by a massive explosion, including Trauber's recently hired groundskeeper. Just across the street laid a dark beret with a winged dagger, leaving no question as to the involvement of the SAS in this evil attack. Uh, we want this one too. Months of heavy crackdowns on the rebels had not halted these disgusting acts of violence, with them becoming so frequent, Londoners began to refer to them as dinner bell bombings. There's no question that we are in a struggle for all that is good and moral on these isles, and if we do not decisively move to cut off the head of the terror snake, then the murder of innocent men and women will simply become a fact of life. Smoke them out? What is it, Chicago? Cool, let's keep a nice cup of coffee here and keep us nice and warm. The Battle of Port Monroe. Supposedly it all started with a spilled pit. For a long time, Burnley FC fans have pushed the limits of what would be considered acceptable, even for English football. More than once, policemen with truncheons had chased out fans holding God Save the Queen banners and flying the pre-war English flag. The beer dumped on the officers and the shoves they encountered were trying to catch these unruly hooligans was all in good sport, but as the Premier League finals approached, things started to get nastier. The flags flew higher, the chants were louder, and the pushes turned to punches. Everything would have been fine had Ipswich Town FC managed to win. <coughs> The club and most of the town were known to support the government, but come what may, but in a thrashing might have shut the clarets up for good for a couple months. But this was not to be. Along the pass down the field by Angus fell for Walker to cross over to Harris, a Burnley favorite and winking Himmler supporter. This last pass would forever be debated among football circles. Was it offsides? What if it hadn't been a Harris that scored? Were the rest secret Himmler supporters or paid off by resistance members? But as Harris jumped across the field of victory and after the goal, none of this mattered to the Burnley fans. And after... Shortly, the roar just died down. The chanting uh, started, Crowds, crowds, wherever you may be, F off, off to your own country. Shortly thereafter, the two sections soon crashed against each other, red against blue, in a maelstrom of disorganized violence. Fans poured out onto the field and were thrown over the stands. By the time order had been restored, the match was canceled. Two were dead and dozens more seriously injured in what would forever be known as the Battle of Portland Road. It's in the open now, and don't mess with their football, I guess. That's all I know. <clears throat> yeah, I should have got more guns, but whatever. All I care about is construction, because this is really not too bad. This whole Civil War stuff is really not bad. It's a little difficult because, oh, spoiler alert, at the end here, when you do the Civil War, you have to fight the Cornwall Garrison. Just saying. What? Even then, they're not bad. If you know how to organize the stuff, it's not that bad. Cool. Oh, we can't, still can't do that one. That's fine. Couple tongues. Who dares wins? Yeah, why not? David Sterling and Arthur Harris have ensured that the Rebellion's force will not lack for elite troops and tactical advantages. A bright spot in the group characterized as a ragtag bunch of untrained rebels and paramilitary units, their SAS has been feared by the Germans and the collaborators alike for many years, and the recent unveiling of their own air force has certainly <clears throat> caused a great deal of consternation amongst the enemy. They have many other tricks up their sleeves and they promise it will save England, but their effectiveness remains to be seen. Our gun shipment most su successful. You want to buy that? Please go ahead. Take what we can get. Great. Right now, all we're going to do is just build ourselves up with more industry stuff, so... Actually, no. This one first. Research. That'll be good. Uh, now it's not existing again. God dang it. Well, I made a mistake. Whatever. I made a mistake. Goodbye, try over it. Okay, now we can do that one. Thank God. Multiple boosts bo over time, then next time we're just going to get a lot of relationship boosts. But eventually. Getting 90 more guns will be fine for the next month. Uh, win with Wingate. The revolution has friends in high places. It has had to be in order to survive these troubled times. One of them is General working for the government led, led by the name of Ord Wingate. 
No, ma no doubt the fascist side of him theirs when they negotiated his release from the Japanese after the war, but Wingate never forgot who abandoned him and his men to die, and his most receptive to our plans for England. Wingate will approach uh, the fascist government to inquire as to whether he might train a force to hunt down Sterling and his commanders went, who went rogue at the war's end, using the same tactics to track and eventually defeat him, of course. What Wingate actually will be doing is training the beginning of the Red Army, one that will bring the fascists to their knees, of course. Alright, so we're running out of guns already, which is really bad. Uh, actually, I already have a save with everything pretty much already to go, but whatever. Um, that's fine. Even if we can't get all the brown spots, that's fine. And now we're out of guns. God dang it. Oh, we're low. We will do that one. Where do we get a small boost now? Actually, how, how many days does that take? 12 days? 1 day? For, hey, that was moderate. Eh, it's alright. Whatever. Not really too worried about it. As long as we get it by the end of the month, that's fine. A barbaric quest. Olivia met Matilda almost two years ago in a dingy ballads of secondary school. Matilda seemed quite lonely, so Olivia hoped that she could give her comfort. Within three weeks, they were flirting. Within four, they were in love. Most of their secret courtship occurred between, uh, behind the empty box sheds at school, empty for a lack of box students can afford. Today was the last day of sixth form for both of them. The rest of the students cleared off, and she, and here she was behind the box sheds waiting again. Olivia always arrived first. Matilda was always a careful one. Olivia wondered how she'd take the big news, but Matilda always promised to be with her after all. And there, it clears that she was. Matilda trudged around the corner, looking clearly exhausted after a difficult final exam. She sat next to Olivia and leaned on her shoulder, breathing out. You look tense, Olivia said smilingly. Matilda, smiling already, laughed a tad. Tad, that could be considered an understatement. How do you assume you did? She replied. Eh, why bother? I probably failed, but darling. What is it, Olivia? Matilda said quizzically, moving up uh, from Olivia's shoulder. I want to join the resistance. The terrorists? Why would you ever want to join that awful organization, Olivia? You know you'd better. You should know better than that. They aren't terrorists. Uh, 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 listen, I have a mate in the resistance. His name is Paul. The government has only lied and spread mistruths about them, and I want to fight for what's right. Olivia, you can't. Maddie, you know there's no future for us like this. We'll be found out, we'll be put in prison, or we'll be shot first. And if I'm getting shot, I'd rather get shot and make a difference to this ghastly place. Please, please, please come with me, for uh, me at least. Olivia clasped Matilda's hand, stared deeply into her pretty blue eyes. For us, Matilda stared at the wall and thought for a couple moments. She opened her mouth to say something. I'm coming with you for us and for country. <laughs> We're doing it for the country. See? Oh, we're fine. How many guns do we not have? We have 70 guns. It's alright. We need more PP. And then under the noses, because we need... No, no, no. We want Cloud Strategy to get some more PP first. Himmler is despite the name, not united by dedication to the restoration of the Queen, even if a significant portion of the membership supports it. And a movement with the Communists, Republicans, and even a handful of fascists who see in the light. What well, unites Himmler as a figure of Cloud Alkenleck? Hey, good, great. Look at that. Known to most simply as the boss, almost nobody outside Himmler's upper ranks is aware that former General Turn MP leads the greatest rebel group in the Isles, and they would like to keep it that way. Cloud Auchinleck united those who believe in a free England through sheer unwavering will, and that he has kept his position by keeping the government alive, or movement alive, despite many attempts by the collaboration of his government to ensure the opposite. Himmler answers to Auchinleck, Auchinleck and no one else. Nice. Alright, all good here? Fuel, because we can. And we have 1100 manpower, too. And our GDP growth is really bad. Go figure. And let's get a medium shipment now. Hopefully it'll work well. And it's almost August, everyone. Happy August. <clears throat> I'll give another day. Why not? There we go. Alright, so we have a little bit more than a year left before things really start kicking off. Quick check through. I'm pretty sure I did all these. Yes, I did. Cool. Cloud strategy. Cloud strategy. Clouds. Clouds. Hey, we have our relations. That's pretty good. For now, though. Under the noses. Uh, flood of volunteers. Let's get the leader speaks. Propaganda has value. Something Claude Auchinleck has come to know quite keenly in the fight for English liberation. But when all the general's public... General public knows of Himmler's rumored leader as a shadowy figure playing chess master. It might be understandable that they feel uneasy about him. Look at that, great. So Alkenlach took the risk of making his first public speech to the Himmler membership. With a scarf concealing his identity and some deliberate altering of the recorded audio, no one would ever guessed the mild man MP from Hampshire is one of the one addressing a hall of Himmler's most notorious militants. It is a speech that delves into many topics: the ruination of English soil, the unjust imprisonment of martyrs, and the corruption of institutions once respected. But at the end, the hall and many people in their homes have but one thing to say. God save the queen. Hey, look, excellent relationship. Um, actually, now we can do this one. So 
The major advantage held by the collaboration's government over our own forces at this time is that they have a small number of dedicated armored units and they do not. This is something that we need to be changed and changed fast. The Americans are all the only ones we can even hope to ask, but it's equally as important. We want an iron grasp on the English North where we plan to smuggle them in. If the Americans agree and control is secure, the first tanks under our control should arrive soon. Requires a minimum level of excellent relations. Ship success, shipment success will then be dependent on whether the average stability of all three North English states are 70% or higher. I'm not going to do that one. There's no way we're going to get this to 70%. 50, 45, 50. We're not going to get that. I'll be honest. We're not going to get that here. So, um, I will get the largest gun shipment though. Yeah, even if you don't get this, like special project shipments, you'll be totally fine if you just do what we're doing here. Barbaric entry. Matilda and Olivia walked together through the busy Brighton crowd on a rainy day, followed by a man, following a man in yellow raincoat. He turned and stopped at a small, innocuous-looking shop in the middle of the street called Montague's Antiques, gesturing towards the girls to come with him inside. With him inside, there was a man looking to be in his fifties reading the newspaper at the till. The man in the raincoat searches the shop to see if there's anyone else around. He turns around, the person reading the newspapers. They whisper together for a second. The man at the nod, till nods, and he opens a door slightly behind some clutter. The man in the raincoat nods at the girls to follow and gestures at the girls to mind the step as they enter. They enter a small dingy room with another man at the table at the back. The man looks slightly or around slightly and looks at the man in the raincoat derisively. Two women, Paul. He snickers. Oh come on, Jeffries. It's not like they're the first you've taken in. Paul said, putting down the hood of his raincoat. Olivia tries to speak up, but is interrupted. We're supposed to be protecting the women and children, and you bring me two young girls? Jeffries, they can fire a gun, that's all you need, isn't it? I suppose, Jeffries mused. He looked up at the girls' names. Olivia piped up first. Olivia Adler. Very good, and you? Pointed his pen at Matilda. M Matilda Lewis. Hmm. And so it went. Jeffries asked the women questions. They answered, but they rang from obvious to obscure, but in the end, it came down to one question. Are you prepared to give anything for free England? Yes, I am. Sure. <laughs> Excellent, ladies. Welcome to Her Majesty's Most Loyal Resistance. Thank you very much. And that's all you need. No no initiation. Just say you want to join, and you'll be accepted, apparently. Full of volunteers, though. Oh, but first, we got to talk about this here budget. we got to spend, and we got to cut. Because it won't even matter what we do in the end. <clears throat> for the military stuff. As a member of Parliament in a war hero, Cloud Auchinleck is afforded a certain respect by much of England. He was the last man standing in the Carlyle's ass, or Carlyle, after all, and as such has become the patron of several charitable organizations in addition to hosting many public events. It's a merely coincidence that Himmler recruiters are often frequent at these events, and that Auchinleck often speaks to those who have reason to be disaffected by the current social order. Auchinleck knows that Himmler cannot rely entirely on his extant forces. When the day of liberation comes, every man who can hold a rifle will be needed. Thanks to his efforts, there may be a few more than expected, of course. <clears throat> and happy... Oh, six. Oh, well, my bad, I missed the day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. Now, we're going a lot faster than when I originally played this. Um, my first time playing when I played as Thatcher, so... Uh, we should have more than enough guns for now, from here on out. But, yeah, you never know. Eventually, I will be doing a lot more state stability stuff, but it's only September, so we got more time. Because you're going to need state stability for certain events and uh, decisions for harming the government's ability to wage war. We're going to get closer to the Civil War, of course. So We have so many guns. Look at that. <clears throat> Getting a successful large amount of guns is great. The leader speaks? Great. You know what? We'll grab another one. Once the focus is done, of course. Hopefully, they'll all come through. But you never know. Cool. And under the noses. I love noses. Smuggling might not be a dignified profession, but the revolution isn't built on soldiers alone. We need engineers, truck mechanics, and factory workers just as bad as we do lads with a gun. And coming up with supplies in England can be a bit hard these days. Hence why the southern dockyards and the constant flow of ships are so important to us. With forewarning, we can get a shipment of old Yank rifles. From Dockside, Liverpool, to London, or Carlisle in two days. Plus, we don't have to bribe the fascist guards, of course. Now, our ability to get to and fro comes with some other uses, too. More than one fascist official has gone missing on the evening stroll. More than a few others will join him. Nice. Good stuff. No one likes them fascists. Uh, I think I want to get a medium gun shipment. I like to do... I like them large. Oh. Oh, now... Okay, it's auto safe. I thought I missed it. Hey, look. Even Sussex is now neutral. Sort of. Not bad, my friends. Not bad. I want to get improve the relationship maybe a little bit. Probably by a moderate amount, and then we'll get more guns. Yeah, that stuff is not too bad. Once you understand, it's pretty easy. Then again, if it was really difficult, then I'd probably tear my hair out, but... Luckily, we're not playing uh, Long Yoon's Yunnan. Oh boy. Someday. I will play it on this channel. I promise you that, but not today. <laughs> not today. Yeah, I want to get the, another large gun shipment first. Just make sure we're really good for a while. A lot of volunteers under our noses. Now, unfortunately, i got to make the decision here whether we take out the Midlands. We're staying in the north, which gives us more stability in Newcastle and Yorkshire. Or moving south. Um, honestly, staying in the north uh, and Newcastle and Yorkshire, 
which I think is how you say it. Yorkshire, not Yorkshire. As an American, it looks like Yorkshire. Um, we get 15 state stability, which isn't bad. There is a, a, a thing later on that focuses that you need 75%, I believe, in Newcastle, maybe? I would like the Midlands, honestly, just to make sure that they, we guaranteed them to join us. We have, have enough support up here anyway, so... Um, if you're wondering about this, please go ahead. I, that's okay. I and mean, we're doing really well up here. I don't want to really do this one either, because doing the South stuff is okay. But I really want to be guaranteed the, of the Midlands, so... England's Midlands are a flat country. Not many hills and only scattered woodlands will break up the endless landscapes of fields and villages. Not a land one would think lend itself well to guerrilla warfare, yet that is exactly what David Sterling has done for the last two decades. Sterling would have Himmler take up the struggle in the center of this country, able to split the collaborationist forces in two from the start and gain control of the vital industry in the region's cities. Birmingham is an excellent staging point for supplying ammo and guns throughout England. Bill Alexander is less keen on moving as the Midlands are far from the left resistance's powers base, but he is willing to secede to, cede to Achenlech's judgment on the matter. A barbaric relaxation. Matilda's joins... Hey, they do that if you'd spend a whole day running from place to place, learning how to shoot a gun, being ooled by a man who never learned basic respect, and being shouted at by an angry man wearing uniform she would swear on her life had been clean since the 1940s. She collapsed on a Paul's dilapidated lumpy couch. He had let them stay in his ratty flat, which was nice of him considering the fact that they just ran away from home. Matilda wondered if her parents were searching for her. Were they worried? She shook it off. Don't think about them. They'll, they'll just event forget about her eventually. At least she hoped they would. She started to tear, tear up despite herself. Matilda? Matilda rubbed her eyes and blinked. Oh, I'm sorry, Olivia. Just thinking, getting lost in my own thoughts. Olivia sat down on the couch next to Matilda, practically, fall, practically falling on it. Your legs? Matilda asked. Yeah. God, it was effing brutal, wasn't it? I swear on my life we won't be able to walk in two weeks, let alone shoot some policemen. And so the evening moved on. They had talked a lot, after all. They had been through the looking glass at that point. Two 19-year-old girls in Seaside joining what they had been called a terrorist organization. They're 19? I thought they were like 16. So my dad's right. He ties up the boats and the knot slips and I go floating out on the lake. The story wasn't very funny, but Matilda laughed anyways. You're amazing, Olivia, she said, still grinning. I know, Olivia replied confidently. Matilda leans back, stretching. I am bloody exhausted. She pulled out of her embrace before kissing Olivia sweetly. I suppose we better get to bed then. The girls lay together in each other's arms on Paul's bed. It was bumpy and uncomfortable, but that didn't matter. Darling whispered, uh, Matilda. What is it, Matilda? Uh, Olivia whispers back. I'm so happy you're here for me. Because we're going to get shot maybe in the end. Maybe. We'll see. Hey, it's only 9.5 billion in deficit, that's all. Ah, look at that. See, no worries, no problems. We got so many guns. But as an American, there are never enough guns. Never, ever, ever enough guns. As you can see, I got, we're just trying to beeline through this as much as possible. Alright, next up. Uh, now, let's see. Oh, moving south, guns. Lord help us, the Reds have rifles. I oh, we get stability in Lancashire, too. Cool. They will speak of Sussex. I like this one. In order to hand over. The traitors purged uh, the army of most lads who can think for themselves, or what that's, uh, that's what Sterling says when he smocks their corpses. The thing about rebellion is that without some guns to shoot the traitors with, the whole thing will be over rather quickly. Even the Reds can't ship in enough firearms to equip us all, which is where our lot comes in. The protocol doesn't change that much from year to year in the army, which means that when a very cross-looking colonel turns up at a depot with a convoy of trucks asking why the F they aren't ready to pay packed already, the poor buggers on duty jump to its quick. Helped along with a few of our own on the inside, of course. I'm told the hall was over 20,000 semi-automatic rifles alone. 20,000? Is that all you got? Look at that. No brown here. We don't like brown here in England. What can brown do for you? Well, we can ship a lot of guns over. Cool, and... Ah, uh, London. Don't forget about London. I'd like to go to London someday, but then again, that costs money, and money is hard to buy. Cool! Also, if you want to know, the other mods reason he said, just TNO, was a uh, player of the Peace Conferences and the Station Hunter Toolmob, but those don't really matter in TNO, so... It is what it is! How are we doing on guns? We got... We actually might have enough for the rest of the entire campaign until the Civil War starts. Maybe. Maybe. So. Ah, taking the Midlands. Very nice. In order to hand them over. Boys, you better hand them over. We're going to beat the crap out of you. We have high relations. I want to get another large gun shipment. So, we'll have to do it later. They will speak of Sussex. Uh, actually, can you get more PP? I like the PP. We get a large boost, which is kind of nice. We'll do that a little later. 
Uh, ah, sure, sharp and sickle. I like this one. I like that event. Lord help us, the Reds have rifles. The revolutionary movement does not possess elite force of Sterling's commandos, nor do we have a truly large force or following in the armed forces like Himmler, Lord of the Memory of the Monarchy. What we do possess, however, is perhaps the greatest militia network in England, formed around the trade unions and factory workers. When the time comes, the English proletariat will rise as one, and the fascists will pay their price in blood. For now, though, we must organize these militias, give them goals and equipment so as to affect the change in a more strategic level. Docks must be secured, arms factories for the enemy sabotage, and other lines of communication cut off all possible. And for now, as we sit back and sharpen the of the revolution, we wait only for the hammer to fall upon its anvil. Nice. Still looking pretty good here. I have to remember, the Anglo-Scottish border uh, might not have been one of the largest in the world, but it felt like one of the most well defended. Pillboxes and watchtowers died on the Scottish side, while guardhouses and patrols walked along the English side. However, these limitations had led to great creativity between the members of Himmler and their Scottish benefactors. A truck had sat on the border, two Scottish members of the armed forces. One of them was leaning against a tailgate smoking, and one was sitting in the driver's seat clutching his weapon. They had been told Himmler agents would show up to collect the shipment, but they had been late. Gunshots then broke out from the woods, and now came some men in the haphazardly put together clothes with rifles and bags. After they were English soldiers looking for intruders, the Scotsmen in the back jumped into the truck to hide if this deal had been busted a crisis could develop. Luckily, after a few tense minutes, the soldiers assumed they had been refugees attempting to jump the border walked away. Not the problem they thought, the two Scottish soldiers waited tensely before they got both out of the truck. Well, out of the bushes at the border came out Himmler soldiers, the one sent to receive their weapons. The two Scots laughed and asked the men if they had been sent by Charlemagne. The men replied with a resounding yes. After this, the two Scots nodded at each other and handed over the weapons. After this, the two groups then had a conversation remarking about the future of the Isles before alcohol had been exchanged between the two groups as a sign of camaraderie. A toast was done to Himmler before the agents disappeared into the woods, which last much calmer than when they had arrived. The beast stirs and training day. Oh, we got some tech done, which we already kind of accomplished. Right here, this is a PE4. This will be your primary tool for blowing the effing dogs in London up. Understand? The instructor yelled at this class of Her Majesty's most loyal resistance soldiers. The resistance had come to Scotland for help, and they and this is what they received. In many ways, from explosive training to being trained to use newer weapons of war. One of the members of the resistance had seemed to fall asleep as the instructor was talking about an explosive device. The Scot noticed this out of the corner of his eye and set down the explosive and walked over to the resistance member. The sleeping resistance member had been uh, spared fatigues given to them by the Scottish military. The instructor slammed his fist down uh, onto the table and the Soldier woke up startled to see the burly Scottish instructor stare at him. Or stare at him. The instructor then screamed at the soldier who was sliding down in his chair. The instructor went on and on about how they'll liberate England uh, if they can't stay awake. He then walked back up to the front of the room and continued the explanation. The soldier who was sleeping had jolted up from his chair and watched him learn. He could barely see a slight smile in the corner of his instructor's mouth for the better of the aisles. A barbaric assault. The feeling of a gun in her hands was a familiar feeling, but a new one like this. In her father's escapades, he would drag Olivia to shoot clay pigeons, and occasionally he would let her hold the rifle. But this wasn't a weapon for sport. It was a weapon to kill, which is kind of like sport. Her ha hands shook slightly, her pulse quickening with every step into the factory. She held her breath slightly, trying not to make a sound. She glanced around the corner. It was full of workers, but more importantly, four police officers positioned around the front entrance. They were prepared. Have the police been intercepting the radio transmissions? Her, she ducks back around the corner and holds up four fingers to the men behind her. They nod, and two of them duck behind the back, firing two gunshots in the air. Hearing the shots, two of the guards rang out, ran out of the front door, going expeditiously around the back for an ambush. Two more of her comrades run inside. This factor is now under occupation of her majesty's most loyal resistance. Surrender now, we will not be afraid to use lethal force. The officers caught off guard, fired randomly, and missed, before being immediately accosted with the barrel of a gun to their heads. Workers scattered while Olivia ran to secure the front door. It was too late. A guard stumbled through the front door before she could get to it. Olivia staggered backwards, shocked, before a bullet tore through her leg. It burned. Why did it effing burn? A girl's scream erupted from her mouth. She fell to the ground unconscious. Her comrades immediately retaliated, lodging a bullet in the officer's head. The two guards, who were hostages, uh, dropped their weapons while shouting a surrender. Get the girl, get the ammo, go, one of the partisans muttered, glancing over her shoulder at the rest of them behind him. And thus, him sweeps into the night, carrying a casualty home. Dark times come to our couple. Or people. Or both. Probably both. Sorry if I'm speaking a little too fast. I'm just... I like what I'm reading here. And I want to get to the Civil War quickly, too. Alright, and next... Oh, we're moderate. Oh, why do we have to be moderate? Hmm. Small boost, huh? Can I, I want a bigger boost. About barbaric visit, Matilda couldn't show how she felt. She couldn't let people know the horror she felt the moment she heard the anxiety that hit her as she rushed to the field hospital. She sat calm in the hospital waiting room, her face expressing as little sadness as she could with the whole reasoning with her more pragmatic thoughts. She'll never recover, will she? But at least she wasn't dead. She had more time with Olivia yet. But there was a certain level of fear within her, a feeling that wouldn't leave no matter what she told herself. Miss Lewis, please come with me. As Matilda stepped through the door, she glanced around. Walls were all white, all sterile and bland. Matilda was almost blind as she followed the nurse through the hospital before entering a door, placing a hand at the end of the corridor. 
and sat with Olivia, her leg in a splint. Hello, Matilda. She, uh, she smiled weakly, her eyes lighting up. How are you today? Matilda turns to the nurse. Excuse me, but could you please... Matilda's voice cracks. Could you please give me some time alone? The nurse looked to shot a look at towards Matilda. All right, I suppose. Okay. As soon as the door shut, Matilda began to tear up, kneeled down, and began caressing Olivia's hair. I just, I can't. I'm sorry. She blurted out more and more gibberish. It's all right, Matilda. I'm still alive. Olivia gently moved Matilda's hand off her head. I'll need the crutches for a while, but I'll recover. I'm sure Paul will help. I knew that this was a bad idea. I knew you'd get hurt. I knew, but I joined anyways. I can't believe I was such a fool. I, Maddie, please listen to me. Why did I say yes? This would never happen to you if I had said no, but... If you had said no, you would have never seen me again. Matilda stopped talking, her eyes bloodshot. Listen, Matilda, I know that I got my leg blown off, but in a sense, I'm happy too. Not the pain. The pain doesn't make me happy, but I was happy to fight for our future, and I still am. I need you to promise me that you'll fight as hard as I would, because if you don't, our lives will be lost instead of just getting a hole in my leg. Matilda sniffled. All right, I'll try, but we're going to need to have a bigger boost to our relations with the OFN. And, uh, mm, you know what? I'm going to do this one. We wait, Mr. President, because I want to get that boost first. And then we'll do sharpen the sickle. Americans are perhaps the only overseas ally we possess who can utter offer us more than cast offs and hand me downs in terms of material support. More importantly, though, they are vital to our long term plans after England is liberated. Without American backing and membership within the OFM, England will be invaded whenever the Germans feel like it. To that end, strengthening our relationship with Washington is a vital part of our operation, including, if need be, affirming certain basing rights following the war. For now, though, all we need is assurances that aid will come. Not openly, of course, lest the Germans involve themselves in turning when we launch our uprising. Before we click on that, um, there's no way we can really reach out and do this stuff. Multiple small relationship boosts is okay. It's not great. We'll wait. We'll wait. It's alright. How many guns do we have? We have we have 4,000 guns, like I said earlier. Like, there's no problem with guns. There's real, realistically zero problem with guns. We have more than enough for the rest of this campaign. Actually, we could just save our PP, realistically, but that's eh, all right for now. All right, very, very nice. Anything else here? Do, 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 do. Don't want to miss anything here. Cool, awesome. <clears throat> now we'll get another large shipment, and we we'll definitely done because it's already December. Nice, less than a year until the whole thing kicks off and we go kaboom. We await, Mr. Presidente. 62% moderates, the hardliners, independents, reformers. I played as Super Mac. Uh, the Honorable Alec Douglas Home, huh? It's not bad. More military loyalty. No one likes Edward VIII, apparently. Twice crowned king of England. Okay. He's hated by a lot of people. That's why I don't marry Americans, I guess. <laughs> Moderate? Nah, that's not too bad. You know, that could be a lot worse. Mm, what? So, this Lancashire is looking really good. Will you wait, Mr. Presidente? Sharpen that god dang sickle. Hey, it's high. My oh, lord, gunshipman. Thank you very much. Alright, military austerity. Cut, spin. Build, build, build. How are we doing here? 20? 23? Nice! That's actually really good. We won't be able to get to build all the rest of that stuff, so that's fine. We'll do that later on. Let's get to the next month so we can boost ourselves up, and then we'll do the next focus. Omar Ali Saifuddin III becomes Sultan of Sionan. Oh, good job, man. Good job. Happy 1963, though, everyone. This year is going to be great. Nothing bad is going to happen. There will be no real big conflicts, I bet. Totally not. Totally, totally, totally not. All right, not bad. As you can see, getting the small boost over time is really super, super important. All right, then. Bulgaria sides with Germany. Good job, Bulgaria, I guess. But, oh, Canada. Canada is famously the home of reactionary monarchy, which opposes the fascist monarchy. Which one might suppose is an improvement of sorts, but more importantly for the left resistance and, by extension, Himmler. The labor underground is significant context in the former dominion. Most of the support is political, legitimizing our struggle. Oh, it's mostly lost. That sucks. Uh, with the exile community and Canadian government. But a significant amount of our material support originates from Canada as well. Bill Alexander is of the opinion that the revolution needs allies to survive, and thus far, few can call him incorrect. Given the events of Cable Street, Canada is a valuable lifeline. It might be time to start making ex extensive use of it. Yeah, 75 PP is not bad. Oh, we still have high? Well, we lost the last one. We'll do it again. Lord help us, the Reds have rivals. As the government struggles to preserve order amidst sickening aid from Germania, or slacking aid, the terrorists have grown increasingly bold in their strike against us. On the outskirts of Brentonwood, an armory left slightly defended due to increasing violence in the capital is subject to brutal assault by communist forces. In the dark hours of night, multiple men in red berets shot the few members posted for security with the revolvers and proceeded to ransack the armory's interior. As dawn broke and the Reds receded to their dank holes. Oh, we love their dank holes. Our army was left to survive, survive or survey the damage. As we feared, dozens of assault rifles, rocket launchers, and bulletproof vests were taken. While what couldn't be taken was 
Left heavily damaged by what appeared to be a cluster of pipe bombs. Ah, I love bombs. A cute hammer and sickle is sprayed or sprayed painted on the armory's rear. Ooh, we love the rear. Leaving us knowing only the vile creed of these dudes. One member of the security detail is now in questioning, seeing that he saw the attack occurring from a distance as he got to the hills for <laughs> bodily needs. Oh, there are no answers here, only a clear need to put out these fires and get our house in order. We will pay every crime in kind. Dominate Lancashire? Why not? We love domination. Lancashire is perhaps the third most populous area in England, containing Manchester and several other populous towns besides. As an industrial region, control of Lancashire will grant Himmler a solid base from which to liberate the southern regions of England. For if we have control of the north, then the south shall follow. The process of doing so may be difficult, but it is worth the cost. We will have contacts in the councils and trade unions, and the police are already mostly on our side, so we need not fear collaborationist interference there. But we will have to ensure that any troublesome elements are dealt with as soon as the call of liberation sounds. Not kill, but detained for the duration of our struggle, of course. Oh my goodness, the second one in a row. Lost. Who is doing these gun shipments? Why can't we trust the dockyard workers and smugglers? What the heck? It's alright, we'll be fine anyways. I'm not worried about it. Alright, time to do what's tried and true and... Uh, I love cells. What was it, like mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell? Never used that in my life, but you know what? It sounds nice. Alright, London's looking pretty good. At this point, we might actually start trying to do some more state stability stuff. Because um, if we look down here, uh, Operation Broken Telephone, Oxfordshire must be 60, Stock, Newcastle must be 60, and then we're not going to be able to do this one, uh, but we'll get there eventually. So actually, next one, Oxfordshire, we'll do above 60 next, if it's not too low. Uh, we need to do it three times, I think that'll be okay. Yeah, we'll do it three, we'll invest in them. Nice. Operation Broken Telephone? Why not? General Michael Moore Cray and John Frederick Boyce Combe are two of the most fa main fascist commanders in the south of England. Craig uh, first helped slaughter com com comrades in Campbell Street, and Combe should have known better than to side with the fascists, even if they did not did negotiate his release from Italy. Alexander has given the order both are to be eliminated, and Greg Birch's friends in intelligence, Philby, has some info that might be of use. The two tend to work together and occasionally congregate with several members and friends in the small country manor near Oxford to discuss the situation. As so it happens, we have liberated a stock of dynamite, and the manor has been has a basement. If we get lucky, they won't leave the building alive. That'd be great. I'm, I'm really trying to avoid doing some of the military stuff, so it is what it is, and it's moderate. I mean, I'm just going to go, I'm going to go big or go home. Go big, large gun shipments, or relationship and stuff. Oh, there goes a neutral state of Vologda. They're going very violent now. That's all right. Got a week left, and how's this looking? Poverty's getting worse. Let's see. Agriculture is stagnant. Everything else seems pretty stagnant here. England is stagnating, except for industrial expertise, which is getting worse. All right. Operation Broken Telephone. Telly, telly, telly. And we'll do this one next, because it's going to be the beginning of the month. Alright, so let's focus on the two that we need. Oxfordshire, or Oxfordshire, whatever you pronounce it as, and Newcastle. Newcastle has to be 60. Holy crap, that's going to take a long time to do. But with 1.5, we're doing pretty well there anyways. You do that one. So those are the only two I'm really going to hit, just because it's so easy. Look at that. Look at Lancashire. Look at how good it is. Cool. We could do London too, because London will be an important one, but it's alright. Nice stability. London is way too low for us to do it, so I don't really care. Uh, Sussex actually has another one too. Lock them up. Lancashire 60. East Anglia. Sussex 75, that's ridiculous. No way. It's fine. It's low right now. Um, multiple small boosts. There, we can spend some PP for that, why not? Who cares? And then, Operation Stock. A deficient. A deficit of munitions is considered a problem for our organization. Smuggling can only mitigate the problem that heavy caliber weapons are scarce even amongst our better equipped units. Operation Stock aims to solve the problem for us. Several old depots near Carl are full of weapons, including numerous grenades and even some outdated tanks the Germans never got around to looting. However, if the facilities are guarded, we shall need at least six hours to evacuate the more valuable equipment. And that means silencing the area without regional collaboration as forces getting win. Not impossible, especially with the German garrison being far away. We will, however, just need, still need a bit of luck and quite possibly some silencers. Cool. Come over here. Anything else here? Nope. Lufthansa 302. Oh, if you want to read about that, please go ahead. This happens every campaign, so I'm not worried about it at all. I'm not interested in reading that. Um, they're going the wrong way. All right. We can only pay, pray and wait for the safety. Every campaign happens. Every goddamn campaign. An opportunity for departure. There you go. Freedom is a risk worth taking. Great. The mystery of Lufthansa 302. Nice. 
Broke Operation Broke Telephone, they'll lose guns, we'll get some guns. Not too worried about that at all. Oh, that one too next. Nice. Anything else here we really care about? Not really. That's March 23rd, so next up, what we're going to be doing? They will speak of Sussex. Sussex, aside from Coventry, you'll be hard-pressed to find a more accursed place of England. Must be why Sterling loves the place, loves the food, the atmosphere, and the silly little traders running about like headless chickens after we blow up a convoy. Sussex is also the linchpin to control the southern English coast by default. And if we can secure it for Himmler, we might as well be able to give more of the military-minded lads an edge on the day of reckoning. Of course, we need to be careful not to attract the garrison's attention. The traitors might be something of a joke when faced with our people, but the Germans only leave their best on our isle. Sterling says he likes the challenge, but even he knows his bravado only goes so far. Um, Newcastle, we're going to invest in this one too. Um, Yorkshire is fine. New uh, Lancashire. Actually, was Lancashire one of them? Newcastle... Uh, that one, London, Oxfordshire, Lancashire, yeah, 60, Lancashire 60, all right. I'm with three, three and a half, I think that's worth doing. Seven, uh, West Midlands, keep doing that one, four percent is so good. East Anglia, that was another one too, wasn't it? Sussex. East Anglia 60. Yeah, we're not going to hit that one, I don't care. Uh, Sussex is good, that's fine. Uh, Oxfordshire. Uh, it's barely going up for us, but that's fine. Well, Shire, actually, I think Blue Shire Shire went as well. Shire Shire, I don't know. I'm an American. Just give them guns. Hello? I don't really care. Alright, and then we'll speak of Sussex soon. And that'll be a great thing. No fuel. No manpower. Ah, I love England. Followed up with more Operation Bad Morning. It would be easy if we told ourselves that the traders were all rotten from the start, but that isn't so, no matter what some of the Reds might think. Sad fact is that most of the lads we fight don't know better, which is why it's all the more important that we get the ones who knew what an occupation of England would mean and went ahead anyways. Gerard Templer fought with a distinction for Britain in the First War with Germany. Shame he couldn't keep his spine for a second. Dude was among those who signed the treaty. And no matter how many hints he'd been dropped his way, he'd never shown an interest in the cause. That's a big risk, but we know his driver, and if we can smuggle a present into his car, it might, just might strike a blow for all the world to see. Ah, car bombs. I love the explosions. Non-existent, we're good enough. Cool. And time for another month. They will speak a good old Sussex and things are gonna go boom. Hey, look! Trucks! Land night attack. I don't wanna give that to the enemy, so do that one. Better trucks. Alright, let's do it again. Newcastle has to be a little higher, I think, right? I can't even remember at this point. Hey, look at that! We got some blue! Yeah, no, Oxfordshire. Shire, whatever it is, um, is up. Hey, yeah, we want that one. This one's good. The middle group is going to turn blue eventually, too. Now, that should be done at 65%, which is great. Keep going up, keep going up. Alright, just double checking. Nice. And there you go. Operation Broken Telephone. Operation Stock, which we don't care about. Newcastle must be 60, so 65. So, it's fine. <clears throat> Operation Inspection. Um, let's do this one next, because we can get it done as fast as possible. Operation Lookup. The fascists have something of advantage over Himmler in terms of the air capacity. We rely entirely on what few pilots are sympathetic to the revolutionary cause within the RAF, whilst they have the bulk of the Air Force under lock and key. On top of that, we've been tasked by Alkenleck with removing one of the more competent fascist generals, uh, Michael Carver, from the table. But an opportunity has risen to kill two birds with one stone, for the fascist general is set to give a speech following the inspection of several planes donated by the Reich. New planes with a fearsome capacity for destruction. The revolution will be well served to be rid of them, and a few sabotage engines and a kill team hiding amongst the air crews should take care of the fascists and the aircraft alike, of course. That's very, very good. Oh. Non-existent? That's alright. Operation stock? All good with us. Uh, we can do that one. I'm going to read the next event after we get to the next month. So. Oh, they actually lowered the state stability there, huh? That sucks. Hey, look at that! More blue! We love the blue. I love the best color in the world. Nice. Um, at this point, uh... Do we even need to do that one? Yeah? Um, it's going up anyways so much, so it doesn't even really matter. Oh! Now there's less blue. Well, that sucks. It's alright. And we already did that once down here, so we just need... London and Newcastle next. So, we're going to start working again here in Oxfordshire. One and a half. Nice. Shire. Oh my goodness. I apologize for my mispronunciations. 
I'm too much of an American to really know. And you're going to say in the comments, and I'm going to forget it again in the future. Just saying. All right. And Operation Inspection. Oh, uh, Montague Stopford. The name even sounds right for the bloody traitor. Well, the problem with killing the bugger is that he's a bit paranoid. What kind of man swaps hotels at the last minute just because there was a storm? We wasted three perfectly good grenades on the bed. To top out the problem, he's well aware of the commander's weakness. He's just about the only traitor who's given us a bloody nose. But the boss wants him gone, and Sterling has been the one set to do it. It seems the unfortunate fellows want to inspect some new recruits to the traitor's cause. It would be such a darn shame if only one of them were to have a misfire. Very good. Oh, I'll get some naval stuff. Eh, maybe. No, oh, let's get a better land mattress. Yeah, land mattress. Why not? All right, all right. Reach out. We're okay. We're all right. It's already June 11th, so. Let's get some blue here. That's really nice. And oh, I apologize for this. I always got to keep double checking this. And Carver, Lancashire, Newcastle. Oh, well, really close. And Operation Line Clear. Bernard Montgomery was once our greatest champion. He is now the symbol of the collaboration's regime second to none. He signed the treaty with the Germans following the fall of London and was the man who ordered Alcumlech to lay down his arms personally. His death is not something that can be argued against. It must happen. It must be done swiftly. The man might be old, but he has a fearsome mind for tactics. Montgomery intends to take a brief trip to Cornwall to reconnoitre with the German with the garrison there, command there. It is up to Himmler to ensure that he never reaches that destination. As a final note, Alcumlech has requested that he not suffer unduly. Nice. Even though we're not going to be able to get to him, but it's all right. Things happen. How are we building? 26? Nice. Sign us up, man. Sign us up. And it's almost July. In the next episode, we will get to the Civil War and probably finish the Civil War and do the transitional government as well, just because of the way things are running right now. So, All right. Looking pretty good. Get up a little bit more and get up a little bit more before the government can do anything else. Let's do that as well, because we're looking great, man. We're looking great. We got so many guns. So many guns. Look at all these guns we got, man. I love them. Alright, double check. Ding dong dong. Bing bong wing wong dong wong. Alright, cool. <clears throat> Operation stock up. Operation look up. We're done. I don't want to do the other ones because I don't really care about it. Cool. And let's finish this episode after we finish that one with Down the Rabbit Hole. Bill Alexander's operated in the south of England for longer than just about anybody. He knows the lay of the land is explained to Himmler. Uh, hot command. That is impractical to just throw a man in corn won't expect to get anywhere. A careful approach must be taken to neutralize them, subvert their men, kill the competent, bribe the weak-minded, and sabotage what we cannot steal. This approach has limits, of course, but we might be able to get of getting more in the long term this way. If we get the right sort of people on our side in Truro, we might even find an opportunity to deal with some permanent damage. The kind even from a soul's Germany cannot recover. Great, but hey, if you enjoyed this first episode of us playing as hers or her most... Uh, Loyal resistance. Most Majesty's her most her Majesty's most loyal resistance. Please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already. And I'll see you tomorrow when we're gonna blow the crap out of England. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.